over the years, um, I guess what you learn to do is to repress, 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 compartmentalize and repress. Hello, I'm Roy Blankenship, former senior counseling pastor at the First Baptist Church in Woodstock, Georgia. Also the CEO of the Hope Quest Ministry Group, which I founded and led up until 2019 when I decided to move away from evangelical based ministries and do a clinical practice in mental health work. I came into the world belonging to religious community my mother kept me in that. I think I went to four bi vacation Bible schools every year. Because in my world growing up, there was nowhere to express that, to explore it. Uh, you certainly would never talk to anybody about it. So there was these tendencies, I would call it, to be interested in that, but try and suppress it. Well, you, you're, grown up, you're growing up in the church, and you're told that you pray, read your Bible, get saved, um, mature in Christ and these things go away. Well, I remember uh, being 13, going on 14, and having a set of friends in high school and being connected with them, they were interested in girls and talking about girls and it was easy at the time just to to go along with where they were. It's, um, now at the time, none of them knew I was more interested in them than I was the girls, but nonetheless, you couldn't do that. My mother's brother was homosexual. That came to light and he left his wife and children and went to be with a partner and well, you can imagine in our conservative Christian family what kind of hush-hush talk there was. Now, it wasn't talked openly because you don't talk openly in these circles that I grew up in. But everybody knew uh, that this was wrong. He shouldn't do it. He's going to go to hell. Uh, oh, my God, how, how did this happen? And so as I became aware of my own inclinations to be interested in boys, it was like, well, this just can't be. Um, it's, uh, uh, Big Daddy says it's wrong. Um, Big Daddy showed me in the Bible where it's wrong. Uh, Uncle Paul's doing it and the whole family's against him. It must be wrong. And so you grow up with the idea that it's wrong, you just don't do it. And so as I got older and went through college, I had a real religious conflict inside about what I wanted to do and what I couldn't do. And then again, I had no experience in how to explore it, how to talk about it, who to ask about it. Um, it was all just buried inside um, deep conflict and confusion. I don't even know today thinking about it, how I would have gone about finding someone else that was gay that I might could have even talked to or, or maybe dated, and at the time that wasn't even a thought that was a possibility. I remember as I got older or went on through college, I would go out and look for uh, maybe a gay bar. And of course, I don't know where one is. And I'd find out later that there was one to the left, but I went to the right. And I'd have these mindsets. Well, I guess there was an angel sitting on the hood of my car directing me and, and saved me from that experience because if I had done that, it would have violated all of my moral convictions. And so there again is that conflict and I would go home and repress it. I remember laying on the floor at the apartment and watching things like the PTO club and some of the uh, nonsense shows, I can look back on them and say, um, where, you know, they would be talking about deliverance and the Spirit of God healing and, you know, God, please take this away from me. God, please help me, heal me. What else can I do? I don't know what else to do. When we had been together as friends for like three years, 
um, I decided, well, you know, I should just marry her because she's my best friend. Um, I like hanging out with her. I love her. And that seemed like the solution. I love what we had together. It was a good life, but it wasn't the kind of romantic and in love kind of relationship that you can have in marriage. And so there's a great loss there for me and I would suspect for her as well. The first thing I ran into was a thing called Exodus International North America. Now I'd heard a little bit about it, but I didn't know much. And I went to an Exodus conference one year and I saw you know, the, the community of people that were there trying to manage their sexual selves and learn about their sexual selves, find healing, and really trying to resolve the inner conflict between their faith and their sexual orientation concerns. So I came back home and very quickly found out how to become an Exodus member ministry, and that's what we did. Um, and over the course of time, First Baptist became an Exodus um, safe church. At the time, we, we, we came to call it the, unwant, the unwanted same-sex attraction, which seemed to really be the f fitting phrase back in those days. Uh, we could um, not want our sexual attractions and therefore control our sexual selves and pray that God would help us be mature disciples of Christ. My ministry um, was a quest for me. If I can help others find the solution, I'm really also helping me find the solution. Finally, we can get resolve and, and closure and find peace in our hearts about this conflict that's been there um, for years and years since I can remember. I was exposed to, all of a sudden, leaders, other leaders in Exodus who... Um, promoted change, said they had changed, but had not changed. For example, maybe there's one that still enjoys looking at gay porn. And I'm like, wait a minute. Um, I thought we were changed. I thought we were working towards change. Um, then I would discover that someone who had been promoted as a changed person got caught in a gay bar and on and on. There's just these incongruencies or discrepancies that I began to discover. So it caused me to reflect on, are we really doing anything constructive with this effort of conversion? And the answer was no. Um, I wrestled with that for a long time and, in, 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 and through the wrestling came to the place where I pulled away from Exodus and resigned from the board of directors. I'm doing the mixed orientation marriage thing. I've been doing it for 35 years. Is that really what I want? But it doesn't matter. It's what I did and I'm going to honor that commitment. And I, I'm like, great turmoil about all of this going on. Well, in looking back on it, um, right about the time that I thought I might need to sit down and reevaluate what I do with that, my wife Nancy got sick unexpectedly with um, acute leukemia and we found that out on February the 25th and then on March the 31st she died. Uh, all of the repressed sexual content in my life came uncompartmentalized. It's like because she's gone I knew in my mind that I don't have to any longer stay committed to the mixed orientation marriage and so I came to this it wasn't a crossroads any longer. It was a T in the road. And literally, I sat here in, in this room and r wrestled with, okay, I can either abandon everything I've ever known about religion. Um, no, I can walk away from everything I've ever known in the community of religion that I grew up in, Southern Baptist. Or... I can be gay. And the T in the road was that um, I can't marry a woman and I can't be alone, so maybe it's time to just end my life. 
I went to bed that night thinking tomorrow I'll wake up. Um, I'll think about a, um, a way to accomplish that goal. I don't like pain, so I was going to just study out options to do it that wouldn't hurt. And it was that very next day that I met Michael uh, unexpectedly. And it's like, I can't explain it. I would have never told you that love at first sight is a real thing, but that's what it was. I remember him walking down the steps from his apartment and I'm standing there on the sidewalk and I looked at him and it's like something in me said, I've been looking for you my whole life and there you are. And it was like an impartation into my soul that just awoke and long story short, I've been with him ever since. Six months later, Michael and I decided to be married. And it was at that time that I realized, well, in all my efforts to change, it's, um, I, I'm 60 at the point, 60 years old. I've worked hard to change. I've done everything there is that anybody's ever heard of that you can do to try and change. I've helped others try to change. They didn't change. I haven't changed. We're not going to change. Therefore, I just have to be who I am. And now that Nancy's gone, I can do that. And I made the decision that I was going to marry Michael and just live as a gay man and that have to be okay. I got on Facebook and announced that I was gay and I was going to marry Michael. And literally, all hell broke loose that day. And as I tried to talk to people, I realized all of a sudden they don't want to understand me. They want to change me. It was devastating. It was, I thought you loved me. I thought we had a relationship. I thought you cared about me. I've known you for 30 years and um, where'd you go? I in, implore parents, get over your own embarrassment about it. Get over your own distaste that emerges or disgust that emerges as you think about it. Get over what you fear the, the neighbors or the church people will think about it. Get ready to fight your church community who's going to tell you that you have to do differently. But let your child be who they are and find a good therapist that will help you, your child, and your family work to a healthy end where you can still love and support each other despite what it is that your, your adult child's going to be when they grow up. You can't change it. I wish parents would not try. They hurt themselves, they hurt their child, and they hurt their family, sometimes with disastrous, unresolvable consequences. I wish 20 years ago I could have just said we're gay, uh, we have to change our faith convictions, we have to change our theology. But because of my upbringing, because of the culture, because of the church context that we all were raised to think you have to be a part of, that wasn't possible. And today it is. From the depths of my heart, after 63 years of being a Christian, I believe that God himself sent Michael Hill to rescue me from ending my life prematurely. Before I met Michael, I thought I was in love and knew about love. Through meeting him, I learned that I only knew what it was like to love someone. I knew nothing about what it's like to be in love with someone. I'm happier now with Michael Hill than I have ever been in all of my years. I'm happier now without my conservative evangelical fundamental friends than I've ever been in my whole life. 